Hello, Michael. It's a pleasure having you with, with us today and agreeing to have this interview. So I'm going to introduce you. This is Michael Craven, my colleague at Unitech. He's from Auckland, New Zealand, works at, at Unitech as a production facilities manager since 2019. Michael also is a graduate from Unitech. He finished his diploma in performance tech in performance technology in 2007 and works for the world-renowned circus company Dust Palace based in Auckland and has um, been the, responsible for light design and, and technical needs of the company nationally, internationally. The company has toured to Canada, Australia, and Michael also works and worked for all other theater venues in Auckland. So welcome, Michael. Thank you, Pedro. It's good to be here. Wonderful. So shall we go, go straight into it? Absolutely. Lovely. So the first question, Michael, is how did you get involved or started working as a technician in theater? Tell us your story. Well, I, I definitely started on the acting side of things, and I did that all the way through some amateur theater societies and then school plays at high school. Um, and in the last year of high school, a drama class started which hadn't been available up until that point um and it was because it was new it had a very small intake so they combined the sixth formers and the seventh formers which were the the 16 year olds and the 17 year olds effectively um the 17 year olds which i was one of uh had to do the all the technical backstage stuff so it was lighting design sound design stage management all those roles were divvied out um and i was assigned lighting design and I'd never done this before. My dad had dabbled with um, well, he'd been an operator and designer before for the amateur stuff 20 years beforehand. So I kind of knew a little bit of it. And I'd seen bits of it uh, when I was growing up and acting as a, as a five-year-old of him doing that. Um, but I did the lighting design for David Edgar's Pentecost. And that kind of got me kind of into it and seeing that, that side of things as a potential option. And after that, the uh, drama teacher took me aside and asked me what I was going to be doing next year. And I didn't really have a plan at that point. Uh, and he suggested I should study, um, study in the creative arts. Um, I still wanted to be an actor at that point. So I um, sent in an application to Unitech to be an actor and got the letter back saying, yes, you can come audition. And it was the next day. Um, so I freaked out and I didn't want to do that because I had to prepare a monologue um, of my own choosing as well as learning one that they had provided. And that was, that was far too scary to learn in one night. Um, so I didn't do that. But I found out about the technical course that Steve Marshall was running. Um, so I went to the open day. And I was doing a technology class at school at that point. And I was quite interested in woodworking and, and, and carpentry and making stuff. It was, it was quite fun for me. And I went into the um, this open day and I saw this beautifully polystyrene carved mummy with um, beautiful hieroglyphics and stuff all over it. And I looked and I was like, I can never do that. That is too good. And I found about the lighting course. I was like, yeah, I could do that instead. And so, uh, and here we are. In, years later. Yes. Yeah, so you, so you've been working in this field for 20 years now. Yeah. Coming up to it. And what was the thing that really, really um, seduced you? Why why you really like doing this? I love telling stories and being a part of a collaborative storytelling process. So that's that's definitely why I, I got it. Well, that's not why I got into it, but it's definitely why I stayed. Mm. So you mentioned that you came to Unitech in 2007. So the second question is how and where did you train, study or learn the technical skills of your profession? So can you tell us a little bit about your formative years? Uh, sure. Well, it was at, it was at Unitech School of Performing uh, and Screen Arts. Um, so I started here in 2005, um, and I particularly wanted the, the stage management route. I was still kind of dabbling with the idea of moving into acting or directing at some point. Um, so that's what I majored in, was stage management. Um, I did a little bit of lighting design as a minor in my in my second year. It wasn't really design wasn't really something that was offered at that time, but they would have a professional designer come in and then put a student with them to to mentor them and just observe the process. And what was the influence of training in your career? What were kind of your main references? Uh, 
it was a career accelerant, I found. Um, it gave, I didn't have any background in it beyond that one play at high school, so I didn't know any of the jargon or anything like that. So it gave me a really good foundation of this is what all the technology is, this is how it all interacts together, and then gave me a network of contacts so then I could leverage myself to then go out into the industry and find my own work. And do you have a, a, a light designer or that you look up to or a company or an artist that you really admire? Um, no, not, not any one person, but I definitely operated for many designers in Auckland before I made the step into doing that professionally myself. So I will definitely be influenced by a variety of different people, but I, I don't, haven't gone out of my way to say I would like my work to be like this specific person. I quite like finding my own style and using my own taste to influence, influence my choices. Mm. Um, what, what's your current function and role at the moment as, you know, at Unitech? Um, so I'm the production and facilities manager. So it's, it's a very varied role at the moment. Um, it's meant to be making the external productions happening. So that's um, finding lighting designers, sound designers and crew to then uh, put on the acting and dance shows. Um, and then just managing the budgets and the and set design and all that kind of stuff myself. Uh, the other half of it is just making sure the teaching spaces are functional and the tutors have what they need. Um, we've just gone through a very long and arduous process of moving the school from its old uh, facilities, which it was at for about 20 years, to a brand new building. Um, so there's been a lot of planning around that the logistics of furniture moves and what the actual building needs to have in it. So liaising with the architects of, of, put, of giving the briefs of what needs to be in each spec. Excuse me. And that's been going on for about three years now. And um, how did you gain the knowledge of lighting design? Maybe you kind of touched on that in different moments in this interview already, but would you mind going again and talking about specifically light designing? How did you learn about it? Uh, nepotism helped a lot, actually. Um, would you so, be able to explain that? Yes, absolutely. So when my parents were doing um, theatre, they were doing it in Wellington uh, for a company called uh, Bain Austin Touring Society, which has a building called Bats now. Um, back in the 70s, it was an amateur amateur theatre company, um, but the people who were running that company are still, well, were still active in, um, in Wellington in the mid-2000s, and so every school holidays I would uh, fly back down to Wellington to spend a, a few weeks with my parents before coming back to Auckland, um, and I got volunteered to, to do the, tech, the, the uh, lighting design and, and operation for this company, and I didn't really have those skills at all, uh, so I turned up on the first day thinking I was going to be an operator, and they said, okay, Here's the here's the uh, here's the theatre. You're going to design the lights. I, I thought, oh, okay, okay, I'll give it a go. Um, so yeah, I'm, I got very self-taught on how how to put stuff together. I'd, I'd, um, I'd witnessed a few pack-ins at Unitech at that point, so I kind of knew the basics of you know these lights need to come at this angle so the performers can be seen. Um, and then it was just playing and having the opportunity to to put stuff up in a roof and see how it worked with actors. Well, I'm going to ask you a question that, that's not in the list. Mm -hmm. Throw you at the deep end. What's sure. the secret of light design? What, what, what is it that, you know, if you walk into a space and you have to design the lighting, what, what's the first thing you do? What, how <laughs> your mind works if you have to design, if you have to animate a space with light for a company, for a production? Tell us about how you work. Uh, well, first thing I need to do is frame the space. So I, I I don't like to start with front light. I hate front light. It's the worst thing that you can possibly do to to a thing. It's necessary, but I don't like it. Um, I like to start off with side light and back light to really frame the the subject, and it it just it really isolates the the performance in a certain space. Um, and then I add my front light in at the very end so you can actually see them acting. But I want to make a beautiful image first, and then allow the performer to do what they need to do. And is there a difference between circus, dance and theater in terms of lighting? Yeah, absolutely. How, how different they are? I think with theater, you can get very abstract and, and you kind of start at that process. Um, 
I haven't done so much of dance, to be honest. Like I've done, I've done a few things in, in my career, but it's not really a primary focus for me. Um, I've done a lot of theatre and drama stuff, and it's it's a lot rarer that I get to really indulge abstract lighting design, uh, uh, lighting design elements like colour and angle in, in theatrical pieces. Mostly, it's just serving servicing the work. Uh, but with circus, I get to really express myself and play with the interesting angles and colours and effects, and and this the the real spectacle of the work. Um, quite often when I go to, to see a show, um, I notice some um, light designers who love tricks and others who are a little bit more subtle or minimalist. What kind of style is yours? Uh, I think I'm one of the more minimalist people. Um, I, I believe that if you are noticing the lighting, then you're probably doing a disservice to the, the performers on stage. And sometimes I see really efficient lighting with not a lot of um, equipment. And sometimes <laughs> I see, you know, a lot of lights hanging in the ceiling and nothing much happening. Yeah. What What's your opinion about that? Um, I, it really varies. Um, I, I like to have a very efficient toolbox. Um, so I will give myself an array of, of lights that I will go into the um, the plotting process with the director. And, I'm, and I possibly won't have a concrete idea of exactly what I want to happen at every time. It's more of a, I, I, I work that out with the director as we go in. Uh, and I like to have a flexible toolbox of, 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 of uh, things I can leverage to get the effects that the director wants. Um, I don't believe in packing every single light in the, in the building into the roof. Um, it just feels very unnecessary. And it also adds a lot of extra work for the crew of putting it in and then packing it out again at the end. I'd like to be efficient with my designs. When I started in theatre, um, the lights were a, a metal cylinder with a space to slide in and out, a, a colour gel, and that was about it. But yeah. these days you have really intelligent equipment that can move and can change colors how you see the development of technology these days and you know is that something that is a is, is beneficial it makes easier or or well, is just an illusion i i think it's an illusion um yes you can get one light to do a lot more things but there's a lot of more work on the back end of of setting that up um I feel likewise, when I first started, like intelligent fixtures were definitely around, but you had to have a larger budget to, to access them. Um, I think it's beneficial for the shows and the effects that we can do. What I'm playing with at the moment is, is in the realms of networking all the um, control devices together. Um, so I worked with Red Leap Theatre Company um, over the past few years as a production manager, and so I've been learning uh, how, to, how to network all the operators control surfaces to the various devices around and using wireless DMX, that sort of thing. Um, what I found really interesting about that, I had to, it was it was designed as a two person operating um, situation with the, one, one person doing lighting, um, another person doing sound and audio visual. Um, it eventually we got it down, everything was so interconnected that the uh, person operating the sound could basically do everything. They'd hit the space bar on their QLab, it would fire off, um, a signal to the sound desk, which would turn all the microphones on and adjust them to the right levels. It would start the audiovisual projector, it would open up the shutter, uh, it would change the lighting state and then start a time-coded sequence for a dance number. Uh, and it was all off the push of one button and it just makes it so much easier to operate. I do find it quite scary though, with that level of interconnectivity. Um, I was doing another show called City of 100 Lovers at Sky City Theatre, um, and that was doing the same thing. And it had a full live band um, and I operated it on the final night of it. So I'd been a follow spot operator up until that point. And what was really scary for me was the um, the musical director had control of my lights at certain moments. He would cue blackouts. Um, so I, would, I wouldn't be on standby. The stage manager hadn't told me to do anything. So I'd just be watching the show. Uh, and suddenly the stage would go into complete darkness. And, and as a lighting operator, you panic because you didn't, you didn't make that happen. Um, and then you realize, oh, wait, no, that happens every night. But... It's still quite horrifying to to not have that control. Sometimes it's very nice to see 
other sources of light, not just the conventional, you know, lights hanging on, mm. on, on the sides and on the ceiling. And the, do you use other sources of light as well sometimes? What do you think about that? Yeah, I like to have practical lights. I mean, one of the philosophies that I have is that if you're seeing it on stage, it should have come from somewhere in the world of the play. Um, so one of the one of the processes you go through as a lighting designer is you, if you're imagining there is a scene happening in the room, or what is the source of light in this room? There's probably some windows. I need to put some lights over on that angle, and there'll be this color temperature, and there may be some light coming through trees, or whatever. It should have a logical real world source even if you're just replicating that theatrically um i always love having practical lamps on stage i just it, it just adds a really nice softness to uh, to people on stage and it's just a pretty thing to have oh you're muted because uh, i'm pushing the bar here how do you improve and develop your skills um <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> Oh, uh, practice, practice and taking risks. Um, it really helps if you have a company to work for that trusts you and let you take those risks. And have you been involved in teaching, in training other light, lighting designers? Uh, yes. How's that process for you? It's quite interesting. I I feel like it's very much... It's something you, you need to learn. You can read every book in the world about it, but until you're actually sitting down with a director and trying to realize their vision, it's it's quite difficult to get those skills without the practice. Um, so a few years ago, the production design and management course, which was um, one of the Bachelor Performing and Screen Arts, the, basically the spiritual successor of what I did when I was a student. <clears throat> uh, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Um, the students there had a very different experience from what I did. Um, the course had been kind of refined and made into more of a more of a school rather than an experience. We were staying at at, um, at Unitech all night to try to get get shows up and running, um, whereas that had been kind of realised that that wasn't fair to students. They need to be able to have uh, jobs outside of it, and so we tried to keep it down to like a nine to five um, style learning environment. Um, so they didn't have as much of a of an immersion in the works that we did. So it was very much where we would need to sit them down and have a bit more one on one tutor time to kind of make up for that lack of time that they would be able to do their their self directed learning. Um, I got them I got them seeing some really interesting stuff. And what was what was what I liked to do was let them go in. Um, I'd give them a bit of framework and like this is you know angles of lighting and color and this is what this means and um the, just the various tools that they can use and gave them a really good framework of this is these are the tools that you can use and now start talking about that sort of stuff with the director and talk about emotions and just learn to become the interface of the director's vision and to what goes on the plan that you can then communicate to a crew you are muted again <laughs> <laughs> um and would you be able to share with us a story about your creative work, one that you're proud of and how you developed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so on a Dust Palace show called The, the Goblin Market by Christina Rossetti, it's based on an Italian feminist poem. Um, I was really struggling with the finale of it. So it was, it was I, I in, engaged in a form of design that I'd never really done before. I didn't want to do, you know, a front wash, side wash, specials, back wash, anything like that. When I was going through the whole rehearsal process, all the the uh, performers blocking was in very straight lines. Um, the set was a variety of wrought iron um, structures that then had balance beams kind of between them. So all the actors' movement had to be in a straight line along it. So I didn't want to do a wash. I wanted to light that pathway. So everything was very specific, but I didn't have my normal toolbox of, of you know, lights that I could turn on and off to get various effects. The, fi the finale of it was a duo lira piece. Um, it was all about sacrifice and had this very 
beautiful building uh, song underneath it kind of started off very sad and then just built and built and built. And so I was throwing what lights I had at it and trying to make it more and more and more and adding more fixtures and more fixtures, just trying to, to communicate the epicness of this moment. Um, I threw mirror balls at it to my shame. It was not working for me at all. And the director hated it and I hated it and it was all terrible. And then I decided I would completely start again. Uh, and I found a really powerful fixture in, in the venue, which I hadn't really used. It was just sitting at uh, gathering dust at the side of the uh, of the lighting rig. And I pulled it over and I put it sort of behind the performers and slightly to the side. And then just made that single fixture just turn on very, very slowly over the course of the five minute song. And it was perfect. It absolutely fit the music. It fit the, the feeling of the piece of the isolation, just a single light source. And because I had so much haze going on in the venue, as the uh, performers were spinning around on the Lyra, the light would hit them and make these uh, these interesting sh like shadow rays underneath it. And it's just a beautiful moment. Um, and so then, see, then taking that out to an audience and just feeling the emotion of the audience just, just building as the song's going on. It's just, yeah, perfect. The perfect moment. Uh -huh. mm. And what are the main difficulties you faced in your career? And do you still face those difficulties? Uh, I do. Yes. So the nature of theatre in New Zealand, because the industry is so small, um, a show is created, a show is staged, and then it is never staged again. That is that is what most theatre here does. It's very hard to get a enduring job. Um, you do a three-week season if you're lucky, and then you need to find another one. Um, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon with New Zealand's population and, and, and taste and entertainment. Um, I've kind of gotten around that by moving into education. Um, I like having the nine to five job and the job security that goes with it. Um, and then it takes kind of enough to let me uh, disappear for a few weeks occasionally to do professional development, to do a season or, a, or an arena show somewhere. And this is the last question then. Perhaps I've got my own questions to ask you, but um, in your career and places you worked, are there any curious or unexpected stories that happened to you that you could share with us? To be honest, no, not really. I've had a, had a fairly mundane career. Um, I've definitely met some famous people doing it. Um, there was, there's an American comedian, uh, Letterman, I think the guy with the bear, the talking bear. Anyway, um, he came to one of the, the theatres I was in one time and um, started messing around with some drapes while the call went out to stand away from them. So I was able to push him away from, from nearly dying once as a piece of metal swung past him. Um, I've hung out with comedians in, in booths uh, during comedy festivals. And that's been, been lovely as they, they watch each other's shows as they go around the international touring circuit. Um, but no, nothing weird. Just It's just a very cool industry and career path and I'm and I'm very happy to continue with it. In terms of moments of perhaps tension or, or the unexpected during a performance, do you experience anything like that that you had to quickly intervene or quickly do something to uh, there, there was an earthquake during one of the circus shows. Uh, so this was down in Wellington. We're doing Love and Money, again, with the Dust Palace. Mm -hmm. uh, and there'd been a fairly large earthquake the, the day before. Um, and we'd, we'd kind of gone into the show saying, OK, if anything happens during the show, we, we stop it immediately. Uh, we won't perform. We'll refund tickets, whatever we need to do. Um, and that show went fine. No earthquake. And so we kind of forgot about it. And the next show, the end of the first act is a chair balancing act. And so it was coming up to the climax of the, of the, the act. Uh, the music was up really loud. Everyone was like, you know, just feeling the, the um, excitement and the kind of the danger of, of the act as, um, as Eve Gordon kind of got to the top of the chair stack. Uh, Edward Clinton was holding out a chair for her to stand on. So she's about four or five meters off the ground. And she does a handstand at the very top of this chair stack. And then suddenly the building started shaking as this, as this earthquake started and there's gasps and then and, and, and like panicked cries from the audience and nothing I can do. And the, the spotters kind of like run in to try and grab her and then go, oh, no, no, she's got it. She's got it. And she just held the handstand throughout this earthquake. 
uh, and rapturous explores after that. It was quite incredible. That's a story. Mm. <laughs> well, we are, we are we have just moved into a new building, Unitech <laughs> Performing Screen Arts, and there is a space there that's just waiting to be used. So, what's your plan? <sighs> Um, I'd like to use it for like smaller workshops. Um, it's it's uh, it's it was designed as a screening room, so it's going to have a big mechanical screen kind of going down there. But we've painted it all black. We put a seating block in there, which can uh, concertina out or in depending on the needs of the space. Um, so I think that's going to become our new rehearsals room for for the building when it's not in use as a screening room, uh, and probably a presentation space for smaller works and showcases that the uh, acting department comes up with. But it's really so, being in a new building. Yeah, and uh, I saw the, the some um, some poles in the ceiling, so there is capacity for rigging. Yes, yeah, we put a lighting grid in there. Um, and I put some lights up ready for um, ready for use. I'm just waiting for the control room to be finished, so I can actually plug it all in. Well, Michael, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And do you have any final things to say to our colleagues in Brazil and people that will be? Um, watching this video, I'd like to come visit and see what uh, what Brazil has to offer. Um, I'd be very interested in seeing the uh, the different design tastes um, in, in theatre there. So this is the end of our interview, Michael. Thank you so much for your um, generosity and sharing all your expertise and wisdom. Thank you, Pedro.